All right, so we have covered now um, bacteria, okay, kind of collectively discussing the two bacterial kingdoms and then covering viruses with that as well because that's typically what you would see in a textbook. Um, now we're going to move into kingdom protista, okay. So if you refer back to your overview of the kingdoms chart um, and make sure that you're continuing to use that, um, that protists are eukaryotic, they are mostly unicellular, some are multicellular, they can be autotrophic or heterotrophic, and some are actually both. Um, they can only live in aquatic or really, really wet environments. Um, some have a cell wall, some don't. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting something in the kingdom chart, but that just kind of hits on a couple of those things, so make sure that you refer back to that. I can't think of what I'm missing there. Um, so by definition, protists are a group of organisms that a lot of people don't really know a ton about. Um, notice the definition though, it says it's any organism that's not a plant, not an animal, not fungus, and not bacteria, okay? So basically any organism that can't be classified into one of those groups, and again there's two bacterial kingdoms, is going to be considered a fungus. So they are then said to be either like plants, like animals, or like fungus as, as far as how they obtain energy, right? So plants, um, of course, are going to be autotrophic right, or be producers, so anything that's a plant-like protist is going to be autotrophic as well. Animals are going to be consumers, and so they're going to be heterotrophic, but they are going to, the, the animal-like protist, sorry, they're going to absorb or not absorb, they are going to ingest whatever it is that they're feeding on and feed heterotrophically. And then fungus, of course, are decomposers, and so fungus-like protists are going to be serving the decomposer role in an aquatic ecosystem, okay? Um, so, like I just said, they have to live in aquatic or really moist, um, wet habitats. They are very simple as a group. Um, even when we look at the multicellular plant-like protists, for example, they are still really simple organisms. Um, it's thought that they evolved from a symbiosis of several bacterial cells, well, where a larger bacterial cell surrounded and engulfed a smaller bacterial cell, and that that smaller cell essentially started to act as an organelle is known as the endosymbiont hypothesis and we just don't really spend a ton of time on it but if you look that up that's what it's called okay so we're going to hit um, animal like protists plant like protists and fungus like protists pretty quickly here um, we're going to go to lab we don't do a ton with protists okay but we want to expose you to them for the unique adaptations that they do have so let's start with the animal like protists which are often called the protozoans um, zoo means animal, so if you think of going to the zoo, okay, that's where that comes from. Um, so all of your animal-like protists are unicellular, they're all heterotrophic, and they're grouped according to their type of movement. So they're either going to move using flagella, long whip-like structures, which we can see, I'm trying to hold this down, sorry if it kind of bumps up there. So those are a bunch of flagella on that particular protist. Um, they move by pseudopods, those false feet or fake feet that we talked about back last semester at the very end of the semester um, when we talked about phagocytosis in organisms such as an amoeba that we can see here surrounding and engulfing their food. Or they move by cilia, which we can't really see the cilia, or well not even really, you can't see the cilia here at all, but there's cilia surrounding this paramecium, there's cilia surrounding the opening to that um, funnel shaped structure. This is what's known as stentor as far as its genus. There, are, I'm gonna come back up here for a second. There are cilia that line this bell shape on this particular protist that's known as vorticella or vorticella. Um, this one's called volvox and each of the little colonies that make up a circle of volvox or have two flagella um, that beat so those are how, and that's just, and actually, let me just mention too, Volvox is plant-like, it's not animal-like, okay? Um, so coming back down here, though, that was just to show you an example of something else with flagella. Um, Giardia has flagella, for example, and then um, they can also be internal parasites. If they are internal parasites, they're heterotrophic, okay, and they are typically going to have two hosts in their life cycle where the first host is an intermediate host that they do not harm, and then the second host is gonna be where the disease is caused, okay? So this one, for example, that we see here, all those little red dots, 
those are red blood cells. And the protists, the longer kind of pink, wiggly, squiggly looking things with a dark nucleus, that is a protist called plasmodium. That's the protist in the blood, and this is a blood smear, um, of somebody that has contracted malaria. So malaria is caused by that particular protist known as plasmodium. Um, not that you can tell what this is because it looks just like little pink dots, but this is a parasitic protist as well um, that is named Toxoplasma gondii, and it causes um, an illness called toxoplasmosis, which you can get from if you have a cat, for example, and they take in this particular protist um, just from somewhere. We won't even get into that for right now. Um, but if they take in this particular protist, then you can get toxoplasmosis um, from the feces of cats. Um, so like if somebody has a litter box that they're cleaning, then that's a place that it could be picked up if their cat picked it up. And then Giardia, this is one that's really common in freshwater ecosystems. So if you were out hiking or camping um, and you did not carry bottled water, carry um, a filter, carry iodine tablets, boil your water, all the things to make water safe, and you drank from a stream that had Giardia in it, you would get sick, okay? It'd be like having a stomach bug. Hold that thought. Okay, let me go back to this for just a second. So I just want to reiterate that protists are classified by how they obtain energy. They are either autotrophs or they are heterotrophs. If they're heterotrophs, they're either consumers or decomposers, being like either animals or like fungus, okay? And so then the animal-like protists are classified by how they move, right? When we go to plant-like protists, they're all autotrophic. Um, they can live in either freshwater or marine habitats, and we tend to classify them and kind of group them either into unicellular or multicellular plant-like protists, kind of just your big groups. So if they're unicellular plant-like protists, um, they are going to be known as phytoplankton. We looked at phytoplankton in the carbon cycle game that we did at the beginning of the year. Um, by definition, phytoplankton are small photosynthetic organisms that are near the surface of bodies of water. And it doesn't have to be any particular type of water. Just um, there's phytoplankton in the ocean and lakes. doesn't really matter what we're talking about. So they're going to use chloroplasts and chlorophyll, the pigment within the chloroplasts, to trap the sun's energy and carry out photosynthesis. Um, they carry out actually about half of the photosynthesis on Earth, um, and so they produce a whole lot of oxygen, okay, for the environment. Um, the other half of photosynthesis is carried out by plants and photosynthetic bacteria. Um, just to give you some context for what some of these pictures are, because these are some things we aren't necessarily going to be looking at in lab. Um, this is in a group called Chrysophytes. They have these golden colored chloroplasts as far as their pigment, so they look a little bit different. I know you can't really tell that that's yellow. This is one called Euglena. It has this little eye spot. Um, so it's a single-celled protist. It's actually got a flagellum that we can kind of see coming off there. This is a light-sensing organ. Not, sorry, not organ. A light-sensing little spot inside of this single-celled protist. So it's not an eye. It doesn't function like an eye, which is a true organ. That's where I was kind of going with that. So again, just a little light-sensing spot. So if there's light available, Euglena will carry out photosynthesis and feed autotrophically, making its own food. If there's no light available, Euglena is one that can actually switch to a heterotrophic feeding mode. Um, this one and these two, these are different ones called diatoms. Diatoms have tons of different shapes to them. They have a very crystal-like, glass-like appearance to them. They have cell walls made of silicon. Um, some of them make toothpaste abrasive and are used in some toothpaste brands. These are called dinoflagellates. Some, and there's lots of different shapes to dinoflagellates too. Um, some dinoflagellates are bioluminescent, so they produce light and live in, you know, watery environments like at the ocean, if you've ever kind of walked through the water at the beach and it's sparkled, um, then those might be dinoflagellates lighting up. It kind of depends on where you are, whether there's populations of dinoflagellates present. Um, a lot of people haven't seen that. So I just mentioned a lot of the things that are listed here. I actually just mentioned all of those first five bullets. Um, then, if you remember when we talked about nutrient limitation first semester and we talked about limiting nutrients, um, increasing primary productivity, so there are some dinoflagellates that can cause um, really dangerous algal blooms that are known as red tides. So this is an aerial photograph of an area of ocean over here that's nice and clean and 
free of the pigment that we can see here on the left side of this picture. So this is a dinoflagellate that's had an increase in the amount of a limiting nutrient provided to it that's grown out of control. And it produces this red pigment, also produces a strong nerve toxin. And so shellfish, such as like clams and mussels and oysters and things like that, that um, they are filter feeders. And so they will filter the water through their bodies and extract things like these dinoflagellates as nutrients. And so that nerve toxin that's produced concentrates in the muscle of say, if you love oysters or scallops or something, okay? And so that if you consume that, then it can damage the nervous system and it can kill you. So when there's a red tide event um, at the beach, and it happens every so often, um, just to increase as, as a result of increased nutrients, um, when there's a red tide event, not only can you not swim, but it also shuts down the shellfishing industry. So of course that in turn has an impact economically on people who um, that their livelihood depends on harvesting scallops and oysters and whatnot that then trickles to restaurants, grocery stores. Do you not be being able to eat that if it's like your favorite food when you go to the beach, let's say. Um, so again, kind of cascade effects that we talked about last semester as well, like with the honeybees, for example. All right, and then multicellular plant-like protists are just grouped in three different groups based on the um, pigments that they produce. We're going to keep this super simple. All right, so red algae, brown algae, green algae. All right, so green algae, we're familiar with chlorophyll inside the chloroplasts, um, producing that green pigment that we're familiar with. They can be fresh or saltwater species. Some are what are known as colonial. Bavox is colonial, for example. This is one that we'll see in lab called Spirogyra multicellular. So colonial ones are, are Volvox as being colonial is grouped under the multicellular category. Can't remember what this specifically is a picture of. Um, brown algae, they produce brown pigments. Um, that's the largest group of algae. They are the most complex in structure. They're all marine, so none of them can live in fresh water, um, and they all live in cold waters. Like this is giant kelp, for example. Um, and then red algae, they produce red, pig, red pigments. They live at deep ocean or in deep ocean waters. Um, and that's about all that we cover. We won't look at red algae or brown algae in lab. Okay, so then the other thing I wanted to mention while I'm on this slide. So when you look at this picture, for example, that looks like a plant, okay? What multicellular plant-like protists are lacking that keeps them from being classified as plants is they do not have true roots, true stems, or true leaves. So what looks like a stem and a leaf to you here is a really simplistic structure compared to what plants have. So we're going to see differences in the numbers of tissues and complexity when we get to plants. Um, and then, of course, there's going to be some structure, we're not going to worry about its name, anchoring this plant-like protist, its multicellular red algae, into the substrate at the bottom of the ocean, right? And again, those are not going to be true roots, okay? So then the last one, or last slide, um, let's actually just kind of start with what we see here. So algae is used in a lot of ways. We're going to watch a video. Um, it may end up on Google Classroom. Hopefully we're going to watch it in class. But um, there are a lot of human usage of al algae. It's now a big source of biofuels. That's kind of what our video is going to be um, about. It's used to make sushi. So if you eat sushi, the um, black line that you can see there, like whatever roll this happens to be, we'll just say it's like a California roll. I'm not even a sushi eater, but I know that one. Um, that's called nori, and that's the big sheets of seaweed that's used to make sushi. Um, it's used in ice cream, syrups, things like that as a thickening agent. Um, auger that we used several times this year for the various labs that we've done, the gel electrophoresis lab to grow our bacteria on, and what was our other one, where we did the surface area to volume, put the auger cubes in vinegar. Auger is the byproduct of seaweed. Um, or of algae, we'll just say. Um, some deodorants have it in them as a thickening agent. Um, paints, okay, some things like that. Just again, it's a thickening agent. One specific food I was going to mention is, sorry, I had to stop suddenly strictly because somebody was knocking on my door. So one specific food I was going to mention is if your family buys Nutrigrain cereal bars, strawberry, blueberry, apple, cinnamon, whatever, all flavors they have, um, there is an ingredient that's listed, and suddenly I'm forgetting what it is because of getting distracted by the door, but there's an ingredient that's listed on those. I don't have a food label in front of me. Hang on. 
Okay, so I had to stop and look it up. It's Caragenin. It's C-A-R-A-G-E-E-N-A-N. C -A -R -A -G -E -E -N -A -N. If you look that up, it's made from red algae, um, and it's a thickening agent. Okay? And Nutri-Grain bars are a specific location that I can tell you for a fact that they have that on the um, ingredient list. So that's your plant-like protus. <coughs> Fungus-like protus, excuse me. So this is our group that are decomposers. They are a weird group of organisms, okay? They, can, they are unicellular and multicellular. Um, we're gonna watch a video about them. Basically, sometimes during the year they're unicellular, sometimes they're multicellular. They're just weird, okay? They are called either slime molds or water molds, and they will grow in places that are really damp and hold a lot of water, even if it's terrestrial. So, like here, this is probably somewhere near a swamp or something like that, a really moist location in a forest, for example, that holds tons of water. Um, if you've heard of the potato famine in Ireland, <coughs> hang on again. All right, so if you've heard of the potato famine, sorry, I just needed to get some water. Um, in Ireland, started in like 1844, 1845, somewhere around there. Um, essentially a fungus-like protist that's a slime mold or water mold, don't worry about which one, um, infected the potato crop. And if you know much about Ireland, that's a huge crop in Ireland and people eat a lot of potatoes there. Um, basically decimated the crop. People were starving, um, you know, as far as just individuals were starving, but also if you were a farmer that was selling potatoes to somebody, then you lost your income and your source of food. Um, so tons of people died as a result of this, but this is also what led to a lot of Irish immigrants moving out of Ireland, moving into America. So this is where we saw the, um, just the demographic makeup of this country change pretty drastically as a result of this particular biological event that occurred. Um, it's also sometimes called the Great Hunger, and I don't know if y'all have or have not specifically learned about the, this year just because of everything that's been going on and this being a crazy year. So that's it for notes. I know that seems kind of long for um, a lecture video, but that's it for Protus Notes. If you have any questions, let me know.